Good morning, afternoon, whatever time it is. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Christy Irving today. Dr. Irving is an associate professor of sociology here at UT Austin. She's also a faculty research associate in the PRC and a faculty affiliate in the Center on Aging and Population Sciences. She uses theories, concepts, and perspectives from various disciplines, and her program of research focuses primarily on clarifying and explaining status to space distinctions in health. The most recent projects investigate the psychosocial determinants of Black women's health across the life force, spanning early adulthood through, adulthood through later life. Today, we have the honor of hearing Dr. Irving share her work titled Life Force Dynamics of Gendered Racism Among U.S. Black Women. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Irving. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. So I'm really excited today to share some work in progress. So I really am looking for hopefully a robust discussion and some feedback on some of this work. So before I get started, I want to acknowledge funding from the PRC, the Center on Aging and Population Sciences, and also the funding that enabled my uh, co-PI, Tiffany Williams, and I to collect the data that I'll be sharing with you today based on those studies, the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. Next, I want to recognize that it takes an entire village to do good research. And so I want to also acknowledge my co-authors. I've already mentioned Tiffany Williams, who I met during my time at Vanderbilt. She was a assistant professor at the time at Tennessee State University and is now an assistant professor of psychiatry at Indiana University School of Medicine. Courtney Williams, who's a postdoc here at UT, who recently joined the research team. KJ Davison, who's a doctoral student here, and two really wonderful undergraduate research assistants, Jocelyn and Ashlyn, that I had the opportunity to work with last year. So just to give you a sense for sort of where we're going with this talk, I wanna start by telling you a little bit more about my broader research program and some of the theoretical paradigms that really undergird all of the work that I do. And then I'll share uh, specifically two particular studies that I'm working on. One focused on, bless you, the relationship between gender racism and mental health across the life course, specifically focusing on black women. And then the second also focusing on black women's experiences with coping with gender racism at different stages of the life course. So now in terms of my broader uh, research program, I wanted to try to create a visual to really capture the diversity of topics that my research has addressed in the last couple of years. And it's all centered around psychosocial determinants of black women's health. And I specifically focus on stress exposure and coping mechanisms. So black women are really central to the work that I do because we know mounds of health disparities literature has shown us that compared to other race gender groups, black women experience some of the worst health outcomes. And so I think it's really important for us to look within this particular group to really understand what are the unique determinants of health for this this particular population. And as I alluded to earlier, I've had the privilege of working with just an amazing interdiscipl interdisciplinary team of researchers, including Tanae T. Lewis and her research lab at Emory, as well as Tiffany Williams, who was at Tennessee State University when we met. And I also really value incorporating graduate and undergraduate students in the research. And th these publications also reflect that. Reflect that. And substantively, I've really been honing in on stress exposure in the lives of Black women, looking at stressors like vicarious racism, anticipatory race-related stress, attributions for everyday discrimination, and financial strain. And these studies really reflect the breadth of the research, ranging from a focus on young Black women's mental health at a historically Black college to older Black women's risk for mortality. So in my scholarship, I underscore the Black women are not this monolithic group, and I really try to attend to various forms of heterogeneity within this population, whether it be ethnicity, nativity, or socioeconomic status. And I've really tried to communicate this in the through line of my broader program of research. And so as I mentioned earlier, there are a couple of theoretical paradigms that really inform the work that I do. And so I first want to talk about theories of social stress. Within sociology, the stress process model has remained the dominant theoretical framework for stress researchers. But as I began to read more broadly, I was exposed to the contributions of other scholars invoking stress theory as it pertains to the experiences of racially minoritized populations in particular. So Clark's contextual model to examine the biopsychosocial effects of perceived racism and Harold's model of uh, Conceptualizing racism related stress are theories that I also leverage in my research to understand stress exposure among Black Americans in particular. 
And most recently, counseling psychologist Gioni Lewis, who you'll hear a little bit more about later in my presentation, developed a biopsychosocial model of gendered racism that is also useful for especially contextualizing the work that I'm doing now on Black women's health. And drawing from these four theories, there are four core premises that inform my scholarship. So first, social stress exposure is associated with poor psychological and physiological health outcomes. Second, racism-related stress exposure in particular is salient for historically marginalized, racialized groups. Third, resources like social support and coping may be leveraged to buffer against stress exposure. So there is some agency on the part of individuals to respond to the stress to which they are exposed. And last, this is where Lewis's model is particularly insightful. Stress exposure at the intersection of both sexism and racism are detrimental to the health of Black women specifically. This last premise is also embedded in the, in the intersectionality framework, which is the other theoretical perspective that is essential to the work that I do. So the intersectionality framework is critical because it places emphasis on these interlocking and mutually reinforcing relationships among multiple systems of oppression. And intersectionality attends to the unique social location of individuals across these systems of stratification. So in other words, we really can't fully understand one form of stratification like racism without thinking about how it operates in tandem with other forms of stratification like heterosexism or classism. And Black women located at the intersection of both their racialized and gendered identities were the original focus of the intersectionality framework in its first articulation by Crenshaw in 1991. But I also like to point out that the intersectionality framework is really rooted in a much longer tradition of Black feminist scholarship. And health scholars are really increasingly incorporating intersectionality in their theory and also their methodological approaches. But there is this methodological preference or tendency towards taking an intercategorical approach. That is research that focuses on systematic comparisons between social groups. And these comparisons, of course, they're critical for helping us to understand the depth and the gravity of health disparities. However, this intercategorical operationalization of intersectionality can obscure within group heterogeneity. And so I'm really encouraged by the fact that increasingly scholars are recognizing the insights of intra-categorical or within group approaches to better understand the intersectional experiences of multiply marginalized social groups. And one pathway through which we can better understand how Black women's social experiences influences their health is via developing measures that capture their unique intersectional experiences. And there has been development in this regard, particularly in the field of psychology, which I'll come back uh, to. So integrating the intersectionality framework with theories of social stress, I've been toying with this concept of intersectional stress exposure to kind of understand the complexities of stressors among Black women. But the broader definition that is still sort of a work in progress are these psychosocial str stressors relevant to the specificities of a particular group's intersecting identities that are rooted within a specific constellation of oppressions. I know that was a little bit of a mouthful. But I'm leveraging this term to think specifically about Black women's stress exposure, but I think it can also be useful for thinking about unique stressors for other multiply marginalized groups as well. So at this point, you might be wondering, OK, so what's an intersectional stress exposure? So I wanted to just provide a few examples of measures that capture Black women's unique intersectional experiences. So first, and this is sort of one of the OGs developed in the early 2000s, the stereotypic roles for Black women's scale focuses on trying to capture some of these sort of controlling and stereotypical images of Black women as caregivers, angry, strong, and or hypersexual. And in doing so, Thomas and colleagues assessed whether or the extent to which Black women feel they must conform to or defy these stereotypes. And they also found that those who felt that they were sort of conforming to the stereotypes experienced higher levels of psychological distress. So there seems to be some preliminary evidence that these types of stereotypes are harmful for uh, psychological well-being. Second, <clears throat> the African-American women's shifting scale shares some commonality with this notion of double consciousness as articulated by Du Bois as early as 1903. And shifting manifests 
manifests as changes in appearance and speech to appear more acceptable or favorable to white sensibilities. And black women often become very hyper visible or tokenized, especially in predominantly white workspaces where they feel this pressure to sort of represent their entire race, their entire community. And so this particular scale is re really trying to capture that kind of experience that black women navigate in workplace settings. <clears throat> This third scale was developed to particularly understand Black women's experiences in healthcare settings and during the prenatal and perinatal periods for expectant mothers. And it gets to some of these sort of hypersexual stereotypes about Black women and the way in which they have to navigate the healthcare system. And there's some really interesting work coming out on this particular scale. But last, and this will be the focus of uh, my talk, is the gender racial microaggression scale, which tries to capture black women's pressure to conform to Eurocentric beauty ideals, their sexual objectification, as well as their tendency to be silenced and marginalized. So this fourth measure, I'll tell you a little bit more about, but before that, I kind of wanted to transition to this first particular study to provide some grounding. So this first study focuses on gender racism and mental health across the life course. And conceptually, gender racism refers to these joint injustices of racism and sexism that confer unique intersectional inequalities for racially minoritized women in general and black women in particular. And this term was coined by sociologist Philomena Ased in her 1991 book titled Understanding Everyday Racism and Interdisciplinary Theory, which was published in 1991. Another perhaps little known fact is that this work really served as a foundation or pillar for our Williams Everyday Discrimination Scale that's prominently featured in a lot of our social science surveys. And sort of fast forwarding to more contemporary research, sociologist Adali Malaku's book published in 2019 brought attention to gender racism in the workplace experienced by black women attorneys. And even more recently, and this makes me very happy, this term has actually found its way outside of the ivory tower, if you will. And the city of Cincinnati, Ohio has invoked this term to recognize the presence of gender racism as shown here in their report produced by the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. And one salient manifestation of gender racism can be reserved with, can be observed, excuse me, with regard, with regards to how prominent black women are described in media. So for instance, a West Virginia County worker publicly referred to Michelle Obama, the former first lady of the United States as quote, an ape in heels, end quote. In an article praising Michelle Obama's fashion sense, words like hideous, drag queen and whore were trending in the comments section. Moreover, cartoon depictions of Michelle Obama throughout the Obama presidency often depicted her as muscular, masculine, and angry. Another prominent example is tennis player Serena Williams. She has been referred to as gorilla, manly, and ugly multiple times by media pundits and sports commentators alike. Even at the height of her professional success, sexist and racist comments about her formidable derriere lugging breasts and sexual undesirability accompanied every professional milestone. And in this cartoon published by an Australian newspaper, Williams is uh, featured as an angry black woman in contrast to a slimmer, more demure white opponent, opponent featured in the far right. And the hypersexualization of black women and insistence on depicting them as angry are tethered to these historical yet still ever present tropes about black women that are rooted in gendered racism. And recently scholars have really attempted to bring voice to black women's interpersonal experiences with gender racism by developing these measures to capture their intersectional oppression. So Gianni Lewis and Helen Neville, who are pictured right here, really hone in on gender racial microaggressions, which refers to these sometimes subtle, maybe even imperceptible, everyday verbal, behavioral, and environmental expressions of oppression based on the intersection of one's race and gender. And even though these microaggressions are occurring at the micro level or at the interpersonal level, they argue, and I agree, that it reflects this broader societal level manifestation of gendered racism. So this is, the, this is just a short depiction, an abbreviated depiction, if you will, of the gender racial microaggression scale. So in order to really capture the multidimensionality of gender racial microaggressions that Black women experience, they conducted in-depth qualitative interviews. And based on those interviews, they developed these four distinct dimensions. So this first dimension, assumptions of beauty and sexual objectification, as I alluded to earlier, 
this particular dimension really focuses on that hypersexualization of Black women, but also these pressures that Black women also feel to conform to Eurocentric, Eurocentric standards of beauty. So some example scale items which are featured on the right-hand side of this table include Black women being on the receiving end of negative comments about their hair when it's natural and someone assuming that they were sexually promiscuous. The second dimension focused on specifically educational work and professional settings. So black women's feelings of silence and marginalization. Example scale items include, I felt unheard or excluded from networking opportunities. And then these last two dimensions are really rooted in these historical stereotypes of black women being strong and or angry. So seemingly positive, the strong black woman stereotype is related to respondents reporting that they've been told that they're too independent or people assume that they're a strong black woman. And then the much more insidious or explicitly negative stereotype of black women being angry is captured by items like someone being, being accused of being angry even when they were speaking in a calm manner and someone telling them to calm down. And in terms of the scoring for this particular item, higher values indicate more frequent experiences with these gender racial microaggressions. So since the gender racial microaggression scale was validated in 2015, we've seen a flurry of studies, some of my own, focused on gender racial microaggressions and their relationship to mental health. So we know based on this body of research that gender racial microaggressions are related to higher risk for depressive symptoms, anxiety, psychological distress, and even trauma. However, one important caveat, especially in terms of the work that I'm trying to move forward here, is that a lot of this research focuses on relatively younger samples. So black women in early adulthood, often in college settings. And so despite growth in this literature, no research has examined whether life course stage influences this association. And we know that life course processes like aging, birth cohort, and time period differentiates the experiences of black women in important yet relatively understudied ways. So a life course theoretical perspective might shed, li shed light on the heterogeneous experiences of black women at different points in their lives. So sociological life course research, as well as scholarship in lifespan developmental psychology has identified four broad life course adult stages. So first, emerging adulthood is a term used to describe a period of development spanning from about ages 18 to 29 and is experienced by most people in westernized cultures. Initially defined by Arnett in 2000, emerging adulthood may be a critical period to examine because of the numerous major life transitions that occur, including pursuing higher education and or interest into the workforce, living independently from parents, and perhaps even becoming a parent. Second, established adulthood, and even though I'm in this life course stage, I, I feel far from established, so it might be a little bit of a misnomer, but Clara Maida and colleagues recently coined this term in their 2020 study to really get at this age period between 30 to 45 years of age. And they argue that it's a relatively understudied stage of lifespan development. However, they refer to it as this so-called rush hour of life when stress exposure might be especially heightened because of all the social roles that individuals are taking on during this period. And third, middle adulthood or midlife generally refers to the ages between 46 to 64. And fourth, older adulthood generally refers to ages 65 and older. And as noted by Carr and other aging scholars, later life disadvantage um, among black women may increase their vulnerability to stress exposure because we know that older black women experience higher rates of widowhood, disproportionately higher rates of poverty, and significantly less wealth accrual compared to other race gender groups. And so these nuances across life course stages might mean that black women experience different differential exposure, if you will, to gender racial microaggressions. And they might also experience differential vulnerability, psychological vulnerability that is to these gender racial microaggressions. And so that brings me to the first set of research questions for this first study. So first using this national survey of black women, what is the association between gender racial microaggressions and psychological health? And second, does life course stage actually modify or moderate this association between Grimm's or gender racial microaggressions and psychological health? 
So we procured the services of Qualtrics for them to administer an online survey of Black women residing in the coterminous United States. We refer to this uh, study as racial stress and gender racism among Black women. And though not a random sample of Black women, demographically, this particular sample of Black women aligns uh, quite well with Black women in nationally representative research studies. Also, data collection occurred in late 2022 through January of 2023. And the analytic sample for the results I'm going to share today includes 422 respondents. So in terms of the measures, we included three measures based on the DAS-21, which captures seven items to assess depressive symptoms, seven items to assess anxiety, and then seven to assess general distress. And in terms of the DAS-21, so we created three distinct dependent measures and higher scores indicate a greater symptom severity or frequency of experiencing those uh, symptoms. Our key independent measure, of course, is the gender racial microaggression scale. We're gonna look at it overall, but also in terms of those four distinct dimensions to assess whether or not particular dimensions seems especially harmful for psychological health. And then these are our four life course stages that align with emerging, established, middle and older adulthood. And we control for a variety of uh, factors that could be related to mental health, like household members, sexual orientation, relationship status, children, as well as indicators of SES like income, employment, and educational attainment. We conducted linear regression analysis and ran statistical interactions to investigate moderation. So now, just to tell you a little bit descriptively about the sample. So this includes primarily the means across the different life course stages. So the first um, or second column really focuses on emerging adults, that 18 to 29 year old group, all the way through older adulthood. And there's kind of two main things that I want to point out. So first, when we look at depressive symptoms, anxiety and distress symptoms, emerging adults and established adults report on average higher symptoms compared to their midlife and older counterparts. And this is consistent with the mental health literature. The second thing I wish to point out is in addition to reporting higher distress, anxiety, and depressive symptoms, emerging and established adults also more strongly endorse or have more frequent experiences of gender racial microaggressions compared to midlife and older uh, Black women. And I also wanted to point out within the different dimensions of gender racial microaggressions, the most commonly experienced include the angry black woman stereotype, closely followed by the strong black woman stereotype. So now we're finally getting to some results. So for this first research question, what is this association between gender racial microaggressions and psychological health? Well, consistent with past research, we do find that More frequent experiences of gender racial microaggressions are linked to higher depressive symptoms, anxiety, and distress symptoms. I should also back up and say that these are beta coefficients, and I'm also reporting 95% confidence intervals from this linear regression model or set of models. So now when we look at the specific dimensions, something really interesting happens. So when we see the four dimensions here, three of the four are in the anticipated directions, that is Individuals who experience more gender racial microaggressions in terms of assumptions of beauty and sexual objectification, silence and marginalized and the angry black woman stereotype also experience higher depressive symptoms, anxiety and distress. However, for the strong black woman stereotype, which I have like highlighted in red text here, we see that individuals who report more experiences with the strong black woman stereotype actually experience fewer depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms and distress symptoms. Hmm, I know, right? (laughs) So now moving to the second research question. So does life course stage moderate this association between gender racial microaggressions and psychological health? And the answer is yes, and for all three psychological health indicators. And generally speaking, there's a relatively weaker or null association for older Black women in particular. So I want to show you uh, graphically what some of these interactions look like. To orient you to this graph on the x-axis are the mean value of gender racial microaggressions as well as one standard deviation above and below the mean. On the y-axis are the predicted values of depressive symptoms with higher values reflecting more severe depressive symptoms. 
Lines are represented for each life course stage group. So blue is the youngest group. Those are the emerging adults all the way up to the kind of yellow mustard color group, the 65 and older, older adults. So generally we see that for three of the four age groups, there is this positive association between more frequent experiences of gender racial microaggressions and depressive symptoms. But for older black women, we see an almost flat line suggesting that there's not a strong positive association between gender racial microaggressions experiences and depressive symptoms for older black women in particular. And we see something similar happening in terms of anxiety symptoms. So there's this positive association is very clear for three of the four uh, groups, but at the later life stage, older adulthood, we see an almost relatively flat line. And the same pattern is observed for distress with perhaps in, an even steeper uh, slope for the midlife Black Americans who are 46 to 64. So Black women in, in midlife, it seems to be especially a strong association between gender racial microaggression experiences and predictive values of psychological distress. So when we look at these particular subscales, the results appear to be primarily driven by assumptions of beauty and sexual objectification. And here we are again, back with the strong Black woman stereotype. So I want to show you two graphs to kind of demonstrate this. So again, we see this positive association for three of the four groups, positive but close to no association for older black women in terms of assumptions of beauty and sexual objectification, but strong black woman stereotype. Okay, so we see that there's this positive association for black women in middle adulthood. So that 46 to 64 years uh, age group, we see a almost flat line for older black women, an almost flat line for black women in established adulthood or that 30 to 45 group and a positive association for 18 to 29. So it seems like this relationship between the strong black woman stereotype and depressive symptoms really varies based on life course stage. So now just to briefly summarize the findings from the first study early or emerging adulthood and established adulthood seem to be these really critical periods where black women are experiencing both greater exposure to gender racial microaggressions and greater psychological vulnerability to it relative to their older counterparts. And what I've been sort of thinking about in terms of this measure is really wondering to what extent does the gender racial microaggression scale capture gender racism among older women? I would argue that because it was sort of normed and validated on younger black women, it may better capture those experiences of gender racism that tend to occur earlier in the life course. However, of course, we want to keep some limitations in mind. It's a cross-sectional study, so we can't really think about like temporally what's happening in terms of this association. Also, older Black women are relatively underrepresented in the data, a point that I'll return to later towards the end of my talk. And I think one of the things that uh, the research team and I have been thinking about is what does gender racism look like for older Black women? Might we also be thinking about other axes of oppression that they experience in older adulthood, like ageism, for instance, or maybe other um, forms of stratification like classism? And so maybe gender racial microaggressions is really not picking up at the multiplicity and the dimensionality of all of the systems of oppression that older Black women especially are experiencing. Okay, so now I'm gonna transition us to study two and I'm doing okay on time, okay. So the second study, we really got interested in, well, we know that gender racial microaggressions is a reality for many black women, but we know a lot less about how black women actually cope with gender racism and whether or not there's some distinctions in coping strategies across the life course. So that became sort of our point of investigation for this second study. So more broadly in the sociological stress literature, we know that coping strategies refer to behavioral and or cognitive attempts to manage specific situational demands, which are appraised as taxing or exceeding one's ability to adapt. So this is our classic Lazarus and Folkman definition of coping. But relative to research on stress exposure, coping strategies are understudied. But we do know from the psychology literature and other disciplines that some coping strategies may be more effective than others in processing experiences of stress exposure. And I'm arguing that they also may be different in terms of effectiveness of uh, processing experiences of gender racism. And also coping strategies and approaches likely differ depending on life course stage. <laughs> 
So even though we don't know a lot about coping with gender racism, Kamisha Spates, who's a sociologist at Pitt, she has examined this phenomenon in a 2020 study. And what she found is that some of the most salient coping strategies that Black women endorsed included redefining Black womanhood, a reliance on faith and prayer, overt and covert resistance, and reliance on social support and safe spaces. So this particular study, Spates et al. 2020, relied on semi-structured interviews with about 22 Black women between the ages of 18 and 69. And though they mentioned that age may play a role in the kinds of strategies used to cope with gender racism, age differences in coping strategies were not explored. So our study really attempts to investigate whether there might be other coping strategies and how life course stage might matter or nuance the type of coping strategy employed. So I want to return back to this visual that I showed earlier to consider how coping strategies may vary across the life course. So as Black women traverse these different points in their lives, their toolkit of available coping strategies and approaches may become more heterogeneous. So in emerging adulthood, Black women may still be finding their way, if you will, learning about what coping strategies might work best as they navigate potentially transitioning into higher education, parenting roles, and interest into the labor force. For Black women in established adulthood and middle adulthood, these are very active years in the workforce. So professional advancement and enhanced interactions in the workplace could potentially be a site of gender racism, and they may employ coping strategies most relevant to their work-related experiences. Meanwhile, older Black women may have a plethora of coping strategies to rely upon because of their prolonged exposure to gender racism in earlier life course stages. So given all these potential distinctions across life course stage, our study really aimed to investigate whether life course stage differentiates the ways Black women respond to and cope with gendered racialized stereotyping. And we include those same four kind of general life course stages, emerging, established, midlife, and uh, later life. So we use the same study, the racial stress and gender racism among black women study. And I forgot to mention earlier that in addition to administering the quantitative scales like the gender racial microaggression scale and the sales, uh, the scales to assess mental health, we also included some open ended questions. And so the analysis that I'm going to be showing you uh, here for the second study is based on one of those open ended questions. Respondents range from 18 to 78 years old. You've seen these sample sizes before, but maybe less explicit. So this is what I mean by like our older adulthood sample is quite small. So just keeping that in mind in the context of both the first study and the second study. And as I mentioned earlier, the sample does include diverse regional representation and other social status characteristics as well. So in terms of the measure that we use for this analysis, so we asked an open-ended question, and this is the one that we analyzed in particular. Earlier in the survey, you were asked about how frequently you have to deal with racial or gender misrepresentations or misconceptions about Black women. For example, stereotypes about being loud, promiscuous, angry, or curvy. Describe how you have dealt with being stereotyped as a Black woman. So this is just sort of a small sample, if you will, of some of the responses that we received. And this was a write-in. So this was a, an online survey. It was a write-in. And some, some responses are quite short, like at the 35-year-old who notes, I usually just educate the person on the stereotype. But then a 70-year-old talks about priding herself with self-confidence, how she was raised to be fearless and told she could be anything and she believed it even when others did not. So some of our responses from the respondents are pretty robust and longer and many of them are also shorter. So you'll see that variation in the length of the responses throughout the presentation of the results. In terms of our methods, we draw heavily from the Spates et al. 2020 article that I mentioned earlier, Keeping Ourselves Sane, a Qualitative Exploration of Black Women's Coping Strategies for Gender Racism. The research team met for over a year <laughs> to develop additional codes based on the first 20 responses, and then a total of 11 codes were developed by the entire research team. The two amazing undergraduate RAs completed the first round of closed coding, and then I met regularly with the RAs to clarify discrepancies in coding and to refine codes throughout the process. And this is just sort of an excerpt from the Spates et al. study that focuses on those four themes and a description of those themes. So now without further ado, preliminary findings. So the first finding is sort of interesting. Importantly, 
Though this issue has not been articulated in prior research, our findings revealed that about one out of five respondents reported not being stereotyped as a black woman. Thus, not all black women perceive that they are being stereotyped. Moreover, there was a distinction in the prevalence, if you will, of not experiencing gender racism with women in established adulthood being the least likely to report uh, no experiences with discrimination. So throughout the presentation of results, you may see me sort of highlight the life course stage that sort of um, is distinct from the others. And in this instance, established adulthood is this period where Black women are least likely to say that they didn't experience gender racism at all. So one of the other findings is that responses to gender racism are often context uh, dependent. So in the rest of the findings, I'll be talking about uh, Black women who did perceive experiencing uh, gender and racialized stereotyping. And so responses to gender racism differed across these different situations and contexts. So in a healthcare setting versus a work setting, and about one out of three of the respondents described two or more coping strategies. So it seems that uh, some women, Black women in particular, are uh, reporting sort of multifaceted ways of responding to gender racism. So this is um, this is an exemplar of that for a 36-year-old respondent who notes the following. It depends on the situation. If I can have a conversation with the person without things escalating, then I will. But there have also been times that I've just endured and talked to my family or my friend about it afterwards. There seems to be moments where addressing it head on is a strategy. Other times sort of suppressing those emotions, but relying on social support from significant others to kind of process those experiences. And we also see, again, sort of this context dependent response for the 21 year old respondent as well. So life course stage also seems to matter in terms of how respondents are talking about their experiences. So reflect on how they've dealt with gender racism and stereotypes with some incorporating aspects of how their lifespan development of SAGE affects both their exposure to those stereotypes and how they deal with these experiences. Respondents reflect on their younger self, how they would have responded differently than they do now. And those who compare their younger self to their current self also appear to move towards acceptance of themselves. That seems to somewhat shield them from being emotionally bothered, if you will, by others' perceptions of them. And we first observed this with older Black women, but there are two quite young respondents who convey similar sentiments about being more mature and reaching a point where they are unbothered by gender racism. For instance, the 21-year-old respondent notes, Honestly, I learned at a young age that people are going to stereotype me and I've learned to be okay with that. So there's that acceptance piece. Other people's opinions of me are not any of my business. I know who I am and I know what I've gone through. So I tend to not care anymore. But when I was younger, it did affect me a lot more than now. I've grown a lot of my self-worth and self-confidence. It's not really an issue anymore. And given that she's so young, I think this also suggests that exposure to gender racism happens well before 18 years of age. So even though I'm talking about the adult life course, I think these kind of responses really speak to this. This begins to occur for Black girls before they even become adults. So the remainder of my comments, I'm going to focus on four coping strategies that appear to differ across the life course. These are the four that I will cover in the next several slides. Reliance on faith and prayer, overt resistance, engaging in shifting behavior, and avoidance. So in contrast to previous work on how Black women respond to gender racism, a small minority of respondents in our data mentioned a reliance on faith and or prayer to deal with being stereotyped. However, there were differences across life course stages with older respondents, so midlife and older adulthood, being more likely to rely on faith and prayer as a coping mechanism to a greater degree than those who were in established or early adulthood. And I just included some illustrative examples from respondents in older adulthood. And interestingly, religious language was invoked in both explicit as well as implicit ways. And the undergraduate RA coders were actually able to really pick up on some of this nuance in the data. And this last response is a sort of more implicit way of using religious language. So a 69-year-old respondent says, I just always see myself as wonderfully made. But we know that that is rooted in a scripture, a biblical reference, Psalm 139, 14, which talks about being beautifully and wonderfully made by God. So I thought this was sort of an interesting distinction in terms of explicit and implicit ways of invoking faith and uh, religion. <laughs> 
So now moving to overt resistance. So first we define this theme as words or phrases that describe the varying ways that Black women actively respond to race and gender-based microaggressions. Not only did we find differences in the prevalence, if you will, of this coping response across life course stage, we also found some nuances in how Black women overtly respond to stereotypes. But first, older Black women were the most likely to overtly resist stereotypes with 20% using this strategy typically through educating others. On the other hand, the overt resistance strategies of younger women in early and established adulthood are bolder and more radical. For instance, this quote from the 31-year-old respondent talks about the way that she employs sarcasm in response to gender racism. When they tell her that she's loud or violent, she does that to fuel their anger. When she was told women of color's natural hair was ugly, she wore her natural in a bunch of different styles over an entire month and laughed about it. And she says, you should have seen their faces. So we see overt resistance happening across the life course, but the way in which it manifests seems to be somewhat nuanced by a life course stage. The next pattern that we observe is with regards to engaging in shifting behaviors. And I mentioned shifting briefly earlier in the talk. So this um, entails engaging in sort of these impression management strategies like code switching or shifting to make yourself sort of fit into or align more with the white mainstream. So women in middle adulthood were the most likely to engage in shifting behaviors. But as you can see from the example responses, black women use phrases like being on the uh, quiet side in racially mixed crowds, changing their environments, choosing to monitor their volume. And as one 19 year old respondent put it, shocking and proving wrong by speaking properly and holding the conversation when it's a deep or serious uh, topic. And then the last finding pertains to avoidant coping strategies. A significant proportion of black women opted to employ avoidance-based coping. For midlife and older black women, attempts at ignoring comments was a primary avoidance strategy. For younger women, particularly in established adulthood and early adulthood, black women were engaging in emotion suppression, noting that they tried to push angry feelings down or numbing themselves. However, it is noteworthy that young black women were the least likely to employ this coping strategy at about 8%. So I've highlighted them here. So now to kind of sum up the general findings, there were sort of several nuances in responses to gender racism by life course stage. So this reliance on faith and prayer was most prominent in mid to later life. Overt resistance was more common in older adulthood, but how resistant ma resistance manifested was distinct across life course stages with established adulthood and emerging adults being more sort of audacious in their overt resistance to gender racism. Third, shifting behavior seems to be most common among midlife black women and avoidance is least common for black women in early or emerging adulthood. So we do find some initial evidence that there might be some nuances, if you will, in coping responses across life course stage. Of course, we always wanna keep limitations in mind. So as I mentioned earlier, there's an overrepresentation of younger respondents and there's going to be some sample selection bias because it is an internet-based survey, which also is part of the reason why our older sample of black women, which was much smaller at about 50 respondents compared to the younger uh, sample. Another point I wanna raise is that this open response survey, while it was a start, this question is not as detailed and nuanced as an interview method where probing of initial response would have yielded more detailed coping responses. So maybe that means in the future, I need to conduct some in-depth interviews. So now I just wanna zoom out for a moment to talk about the broader research implications. So going back to the intersectionality framework and what it actually means for the type of work that I do, I think this work is showing that an intra-categorical or within group intersectional approach helps us to really better understand nuances within Black women and identify unique determinants of their health. And if I can be honest, one of the frustrations of reading the health literature is that it tends to sort of make these claims about Black women as if they are a monolith. And so my work is really trying to push the field forward in terms of thinking about these nuances, like the ones that I share with you today regarding life course distinctions among Black women. Second, the gender racial microaggression scale may not comprehensively capture gender racism experiences of older Black women. So do older Black women need their own gender racial microaggression scale? 
I don't know, but I think that it's really missing something about their experiences. And the third point is sort of like the next research project after we write these papers. Um, coping responses to gender racism may also have health implications that should be further interrogated. So what we want to do is bring together those open response codes in terms of coping with gender racism and link that to the mental health outcomes that we examined in that first study. And then my broader point, and this is sort of, I guess, like a, a gripe, but maybe um, an encouragement uh, for stress researchers within sociology. I think that this gender racial microaggressions construct is really trying to capture the unique stressors that reflect Black women's racial and gender positionality. And I hope that it will serve as an inspiration. I'm inspired for sociological stress researchers to develop other types of constructs to convey the experiences of individuals occupying other configurations of disadvantaged statuses. And as I mentioned, this, this particular scale was developed in counseling uh, psychology. But I think sociologists need to think more seriously about whether our stress measures are really telling us what we think that they're telling us, what are they missing, especially when we think about multiply marginalized populations. So with that said, thank you. I'm looking forward to a little bit of discussion. Thanks. <laughs>See, like a hand. Oh, do I get to? Oh, <laughs> uh, what's your name? The voice shirt? Uh, Jada. Jada, yes. Hi. Uh, so, my question is what's possible that the DRMS can capture interfaces with multiple women because they don't interact with these new people, especially new people? Because I can imagine multiple folks more accomplished is um, able to return. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Population in general, they pretty much have these relationships already mm -hmm. established. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting hypothesis. And I think also if, if I'm thinking about oh, one day I'm gonna develop you know this gender racial microaggression stuff on black women, mm -hmm. I think they are interacting with the healthcare system more. So mm -hmm. maybe it's the, the medical settings in particular where some of that gender racism is occurring that's really not captured by the scale because it really focuses, for instance, that dimension on silence and marginalized is really focused on professional workplace educational settings. So I think you're right that the places where black women are going, older black women in particular are different from younger black women. So we really need something that's like getting at some of those contexts where older black women are moving forward. Right? Yeah, and I would even think like in nursing homes, especially mm -hmm. that would become a whole lot of Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh sorry, that's a good question. Yes, what's your name? Um Sada. I had James too, but I have a question. But yeah, no, it, it was really interesting because I was thinking about the same thing because as a career younger, you know, if you do, you know, decide to pursue a parent position, whatnot, I feel like your interpretation is very, you know, you might not have control over your social circle or some of your older, so I feel like that's mm -hmm. such an important thing. And they mm -hmm. I think the other thing that I was thinking about was, you know, the older generation now, they went through different types of racism. Mm -hmm. And I think that as well, and I think the types of experiences mm -hmm. that, you know, early adulthood will bring today is so different than, so I'm like, how do you sort of think about that, conceptualize that, and kind of, you know, yeah, that's such an excellent question. And I think you're getting at like like cohort differences in types of exposure. So if we think about, you know, black women who are 65 and older, so 65 to 78 is our sample in 2022. Some of them have experienced Jim Crow, right? Like yeah. legal segregation, right? And so I think that's a very different racialized context than an 18-year-old in 2022 or 2023. And so even though I don't, I don't I have a way to necessarily account for it. I think that your point is valid that they're experiencing different types of exposures. And so even like that differential psychological vulnerability, like maybe an older black woman is like, it's not experience that gender racial microaggressions, but I'm just gonna let it slide because at some point it was like dangerous to actually like drinking this fountain, right? So I think like for them, the gravity of it may feel different because of their earlier life exposure to sort of more in your face, explicit uh, racism and sexism. Thank you.
Okay, I saw like three hands. <laughs> saw your hand first. What's your name? Zachary. Um, so my question was also about uh, the final results for all the black women in the study. And I was curious about um, how, like, I know you talked a bit about older like worse like cohorts they um had differential and exposure to stress and like vulnerability. Um but I was curious about whether like stereotypes or like sociological perspectives might contribute to the results of the black women, for example, like the nanny stereotype or how older black women like tokenized in their own way and how that might impact the sort of results they're seeing. Yeah, so um, I wish I had included all of the items from the strong Black woman stereotype because that's probably the one that's most associated with sort of the nanny trope of, mm -hmm. of older Black women in particular. But I think one of the issues with the gender racial microaggression scale is that I don't think it gets at some of that stereotyping around strength and like Black women being these maternal things, as well as something like the superwoman schema scale, which is something else that I study, that really gets at some of these expectations around caregiving and people kind of expecting Black women to hold up the world, right? Single hand or maybe these are two hands, right? So I think that that particular dimension is not as well fleshed out or articulated in this particular scale, but there are other measures that are kind of trying to get at some of the remnants of that nanny stereotype that could be relevant for older Black women. And I'm picking myself because we did not include the supporting schema in this survey, so I can't even compare it <laughs> to the findings for that strong Black woman stereotype. But I think part of it is a measurement issue in terms of really fully capturing some of the harms of that strong Black woman stereotype that are really in that man kind of characterization of older Black women in particular. I think I saw a hand over here. Was it you, Shane? Yeah. yeah. This is super interesting. I have so many questions, but um, one of them is about um, how coping strategies are developed and especially considering the life force perspectives, like mm -hmm. how much of coping strategies, I guess, can pass down from older family members or older generations and how do the coping strategies, um, like respond to the microaggressions that are, be that are being experienced and like whether there's different microaggressions happening for different age groups, whether that would prompt different coping strategies, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just have a lot of questions about like the coping strategies element. Yeah, so like where where do the coping strategies come from? And I think the best information we might have on that is like early like racial socialization. So we know that like black kids, for instance, learn about race and racial inequality and how to cope with it at much earlier ages because they have to and their parents are socializing them to survive in a racist society. And so as I was alluding to with the 21 year old respondent, I think a lot of this socialization around responding to gender racism or racism more broadly is happening much earlier in the life course. But I also think that different cohorts are being socialized to respond in different types of ways. So like the younger respondents feel empowered to be overtly resistant in a way that could even be considered disrespectful, whereas the older Black women are like, okay, we just educate this person, right? So I think it differs. The socialization process differs by cohort as well, but it's happening well before adulthood. And we're not able to capture all of that with our data, but I think the answer is yes, it happens before adulthood and the socialization is slightly different or maybe significantly different depending on cohort. Oh, sorry. Yes, what's your name? Annie. Annie. Um, my question is back to like your first um, study when looking at those graphs and how you see for older black women, the association with um, depressive and anxiety seems to be just like rather just a flat line mm -hmm. to me. Do you think that has anything to do with like mental health stigma and maybe like a unwillingness to report Maybe not unwilling, but just in reporting and recognizing those kind of symptoms to the older black women population, or even maybe like an internalization of the superwoman schema or something like that. Do you think that the like, I guess, how do you measure reported depression and anxiety in the class of life course seems like it could be a big part of that and like mental health stigma, especially right now with like younger people not being more open to talk about that. Yes, yes, yes. I'll say that's good. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in general, we know that um, in older adulthood, the prevalence of like depression, anxiety, like all these disorders are lower just in the general population and among the black women in particular. However, what you're bringing up is there's probably a measurement error issue where there could be issues with. Um, under reporting, right, because of stigma. So I think that's certainly a real possibility. I don't know if there's any way we could sort of like 
methodologically account for that, but certainly there's going to be some measurement error because you're right, like it's more socially acceptable for younger cohorts to express symptoms of depression or anxiety, right? It's become more socially acceptable. And so I do think that that, that is a valid point for the older. Also, we only have 50 older responders, so I am concerned about physical power as well, because I tried to read to it in my talk, but yes, my yeah, so interesting. Yes, Dr. Irving, this is phenomenal work. I'm so glad you're doing it because it's so great to finally be able to have one beside um, <laughs> So I appreciate you so much. And Philomena has said thank you for giving her her flowers because mm -hmm. we don't say enough about her contribution mm -hmm. to the work that we do around Black populations. Um, so this is just something that I was wondering about in terms of the kind of links between mental and physical health. And how are you thinking about, because I know that you're you're interested in that as well. And how are you thinking about these results specifically around life course stages and experiences with the links between mental and physical health? Um, I'm just curious about how we think about that. That is so good. That's such a good <laughs> question. So in the context of this survey, we actually did ask some questions about pain. We also asked some self-reports of physical health conditions. So that is certainly a next step. And I think it's really important, especially because of the thing I said at the very beginning of my talk, we know that the largest disparities between Black women and other race gender groups primarily is as it pertains to physical health outcomes, whether it be cardiovascular disease, uh, whether it be maternal and reproductive health outcomes. And so I think that is an important logical next step in Gianni Lewis, and even in her own work where she developed this biopsychosocial model during the race of the talks about how women need to be linked to this to biomarkers. And that's what I'm writing it right on. I'm like, can I say it open? Yeah, I'm on the spectrum. But I kind of get some purchase on this by thinking about how it's related kind of to these um, physiological kind of biomarker processes. But we know that there's this relationship between this and physical health. But so certainly, we need to better understand like, is this a pathway? Support physical health, especially because you know black women are especially young doing worse than other race groups. Thank you. We have time for a little question. It's not a really question. Um, because another thing you may want to also consider, um, we have some preliminary results in the Black and Latinx study about how Black women characterize their health, both mental and physically, it compared to their diagnosed conditions. And so, like, as you're working on this, thinking about how to actually measure what kinds of conditions these women actually have and then how they describe their health, because we are finding um, there's not a one-to-one, -one, right? So yeah. they are saying that they are in much better health than their diagnosed conditions. Yep. conditions. Yes. Um, yes. And I think that that's linked possibly to the superwoman schema idea, right? And mm -hmm. how Black women think about their health yeah. um, and this kind of, these kinds of coping strategies. So yeah. thank you for that, Dr. And Dr. Luke just published a fantastic article, quick promo, in Journal of Health and Social Behavior, focused on Black people. So, yes, I want to see your flowers too. <laughs>